Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening, and welcome to Join the Discussion, a show about healthy aging and wellness. Every month on Join the Discussion, we will cover topics that help older adults achieve healthy, happy aging. Along the way, I hope we learn some things and have a few laughs. My name is Madeline Franchese. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Development at Hebrew Healthcare, and I'll be your host. Thanks for joining us. I am clearly part of the cohort we're going to talk about, as I put on my cheaters, to, to read some startling statistics to you. Every day for the next 18 years, 8,000 people will turn 65 years old. Connecticut projections indicate a 40% growth in individuals aged 65 and older between 2010 and 2025. And research, ranging from AARP surveys to the Connecticut State's needs assessments, confirm universally that baby boomers emphasize the importance of being in good physical and mental health and staying in control of their lives. Tonight, I'm joined by Kathy Walsh, the Director of Quality Improvement at the Hospital for Senior Care at Hebrew Healthcare. And I know we're going to talk about some of those, those statistics from the beginning, and I'm sure Kathy's going to be able to give us a lot more information. Sometimes you look at your guest's resume, and I wonder to myself, what did I do all those years? Because I can't even believe all the things you have achieved. I am going to do a quick synopsis. Kathy's been a nurse for more than 35 years. She has been a VP of Patient Care and Surgical Services, as well as a Director of Inpatient Services at large acute care facilities. Kathy's expertise and focus center around improved patient outcomes related to patient and staff safety and quality. Thank you for joining me tonight, Kathy, Thank you, and being Madeline. our first guest, and for finding time in your busy schedule, clearly. I have immediately my first question. When I was a nurse, when I was a nurse, when I was a child, nurses really were, it seemed, one kind of nurse. You had your white uniform, your beautiful cap, you came to bedside, you, you dished out medication, you checked on the patient. Now, it seems so many levels that there are, for, and nursing is so much more involved in the healthcare system and the treatment. You have RNs, APRNs, LPNs, mastered prepared nurses, niche nurses. Can you tell us what the difference is first? And that is correct. It has there's many different educational um, levels for nursing, and the first one really we have certified nurses aides. Sometimes you call them professional nursing technicians, CNAs. They CNAs, mm -hmm. and they really are the beginning part of the nursing ladder. Um, they go to a very short program, usually around 100 to 120 hours. They then have to take an exam, a competency, and they are then placed on the nursing registry. They do many things like helping nurses with activities of daily living, which would be bathing patients, mm -hmm. helping feed our patients, and doing basic care for them. Then we have licensed practical nurses, which generally is an 18-month program. And nurses start at that level. They are supervised by either an RN, can even be a physician, or an APRN, which we'll discuss later. And they can do basic nursing care. They don't do as much assessment. They can do observations of patients, document and do help the nurses with that. Then we have our registered nurses. 
those are really the mainstay of most hospitals mm -hmm. nowadays. They are the nurses that either have a two-year educational program and they get an associate's degree or they have a bachelor's degree. Years ago, we did have diploma nurses also, but many of the diploma schools have closed. And keep that in mind for one of my questions later on. I'm going to discuss what that has impacted mm -hmm. with the nursing profession. But registered nurses really do the assessments on the patients. They cover the patients 24 hours a day in hospitals. They cover them in long-term care facilities. There has to be a certain number. And they're supervising, so, I assume, the LPNs and the CNAs as They well. are. Okay. They supervise the staff under them. And they really are responsible by our Nurse Practice Act in Connecticut to be that supervisor and to delegate tasks. So where does the APRN fit into so this ladder? Now the APRN is an advanced practice nurse. That is um, a requirement that you have a master's degree or higher. We now have, you know, advanced practice nurses with PhDs and also um, doctorates so of nursing practice. So we have multiple different levels and it is very confusing to the community many times, but an APRN has advanced specialized training and they can specialize in many different fields, gerontology, psychiatric, um, internal, like almost like an internal medicine or primary mm -hmm. care is what we normally call it. So there's many fields they can go into, even your nurse anesthetists in hospitals that may be giving you anesthesia, those are advanced practice nurses. Okay. So we have many openings and that's what's made it so great for nursing. You have so many more opportunities nowadays to move into other fields. Now, what about and the niche move. nurses? Where is that? In now, all this? niche nurses, I can talk a little bit about that. Because you're a niche that's nurse, correct? I am. And it's really a specialized education that's really geared towards taking care of elder adults. It's really, it's nurses improving care. Um, health care systems for elderly. So it really is focused every piece on learning what differences our older adult population has and how to better care for them with resources and tools. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, to me, it's the bookend, I guess, of pediatrics. And it seems as if when I was a child, we went to GPs. Then when I had my children, of course, we took our children to pediatricians. Geriatricians, um, most adults, do they see a geriatrician? Is that a common specialty? Never mind a niche certified nurse with a focus on geriatrics. And based on the stats, we certainly are going to need them. So. Geriatricians is a breed that we could have many, many more of. I just mm -hmm. looked up the statistics today before I came here, and there's only 7,000 mm -hmm. geriatricians in the entire United States, which <laughs> is a very low number. And it is such a focus that we need because patients and families, we have this boom of people, um, really aging and in by 2050 they said we were going to have 40 million more people over 65 mm -hmm. and the geriatrician is really a specialty program after the physician has finished their primary residency so you would go on and maybe be a internal medicine mm -hmm. primary family practice and then you would continue on usually for another year to do a specialized residency program. It's really another postgraduate beyond. So I'm going to skip a, a question and, and go ahead for a minute for clarification. There are so many terms to describe the older adult. Um, you know, you go get your cup of coffee, you're a senior, and that doesn't bother me because I get a discount. Um, but if they were to say you get a discount because you're a geriatric patient, I think that would upset me. So talk about are these marketing terms, are these healthcare terms? 
I sort of think that geriatrics is a medical term. Mm -hmm. That's what we learned in nursing school, geriatricians, gerontology. Those are really... So Hebrew Healthcare's uh, Physician Practice Connecticut Geriatric Specialty Group, people can accept the word in that context. That's correct. Okay. And I'm going to be honest, most of them, seniors, geriatric, older adults, are very similar. Um, to me, I said the geriatrics reminds me more of medicine. It's mm. the way we speak, but it's not the general public's language. Many times it's, you know, people will talk about senior citizens, older adults, those languages. And it's funny because they're starting to define age differently. So many times they say over 65 mm -hmm. is what you are going to use for all three of the terms. Okay. But the new term really comes out as older adults. Mm -hmm. And they're saying now over 70 as an older <laughs> adult because many of the adults, older adults, are the 50-year-olds from years in the past. Mm -hmm. They are active, they are healthy, they are exercising every day, whether they're swimming or riding a bike or walking. So those are pieces that people now, you want to maintain a healthy lifestyle and looking at that, they all qualify as just improving and promoting health. So it seems as if the population of older adult seniors who we are seeing in these acute care facilities, well, such as the Hospital for Senior Care, have chronic conditions. So instead of years ago when we were passing away from these chronic conditions, with the advancement of medicine, we're now living with heart, heart disease. We're now living with certain conditions. So talk to me about how that has affected care on, uh, in hospitals and for seniors. So if you have the flu, but you're dealing with Parkinson's, you know, what kind of change are you seeing there? I think that's the change that is the most significant to both medicine and nursing. Mm -hmm. You used to deal with people with maybe one chronic condition, mm -hmm. but now because the age we are getting older and there's so much more amazing medicine that's out there, People are really living longer. Mm -hmm. um, I can share a quick little story that may be um, a tidbit that people can think about. Uh, my daughter-in-law's mother lives next door to a woman who is now 101. And up till 96, this woman mowed her own lawn, shoveled her <laughs> own driveway. I need her to move in with me. And did everything, <laughs> yes. And so now the neighborhood is actually taking care of her. She's oh, really, her faculties are there, but she's getting around a little slower. Mm. She can't go out there, and if she tries to, the neighbors are all like, no, no, no. <laughs> but so you have people that are aging so much more gracefully and in Why better do you think health. that is? I've heard people say to me that the, the prior generation is just made stronger. You know, just do you see? I think there's a trend? multiple reasons. I think um, people are better educated with healthy, eating healthy, mm -hmm. exercising, doing things that you take care of yourself and get to your physician regularly. So I think mm -hmm. those all fill into the pieces that people are living longer and doing better and just keeping active. There's so many things you can do to keep your mind active and volunteer and keep yourself moving. And mm -hmm. that, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Um, and obviously, uh, as I said in the beginning, the boomers seem to have that as their focus. And in fact, when asked where they want to retire, a lot of them describe locations similar to college campuses. They want to be in a walking environment. They want to be able to touch a library. They want to be able to go to school. And they want to be able to, you know, be a kid again, you know, even though in that environment of living with people, they're same age. They're, so it's interesting to see how this is all turning around. How is the silver tsunami, as we're calling it, how has it impacted nursing? How has it impacted healthcare in general and specifically in your career? Have you seen and a huge shift? Too? I think the patients, um, 
Yes, and I think the patients are sicker mm -hmm. in hospitals More nowadays. More frail because they're staying healthier longer, but then when they get mm -hmm. sick, they get really sick because mm -hmm. they have several chronic conditions and you're ending up um, treating not only the pneumonia that they came to you for, but there's many underlying, could be hypertension, mm -hmm. could be um, having diabetes, could be having some um, chronic obstructed lung disease, you know, having trouble breathing. So there's so many pieces now that you're not just treating the one thing. It's very complicated, and that's why it's important, in my opinion, to have a geriatrician or uh, an APRN well, that's trained in gerontology. Let, let's go right to that point, actually. So if you're a caregiver of a parent and you dropped your kids off at soccer, you have two parent-teacher conferences and you know there's a schedule of a calendar somewhere about a concert, and you also know your mother's got to get in to see somebody because something's not right. So you call and it's a five-month waiting list. What do you do? How do you deal with this when it's first on your doorstep as a, as a caregiver? If we, let's go from the kid with the parent. You know, what are your and suggestions? I, I think the important thing is to try to get your parents into someone before you get to the point that you desperately need So when need would you bring that. that up? I mean, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, you know, mom, it's... Yeah. No, probably yeah. <laughs> not a Thanksgiving dinner with everybody else there, but probably a conversation like I'd really like you to think about going to this physician who specializes in older adults and I if if they absolutely love their primary mm -hmm. care physician you know they can consult with one or the other or both sometimes okay. you can slide them in and but it really is a good benefit to start getting your parents your aunts your uncles ahead of time because the worst thing you can do is to have a crisis and then have to deal with something which is what what do you think 85 percent of the time that's yes probably i think most people um, even in our own family we had a crisis with um, one of our parents and it really was because the other parent had fallen and ended mm -hmm. up in the hospital and then we realized how difficult it had been mm -hmm. for them in the house together and they only survived because two of them could or work figure. together right. and figure it out so it really is better to start asking your parents what they want and you have to be careful, of course, because no matter how the relationship changes, you're always the child, they're always the parent, and they're never, those roles don't shift. So I, to my point, how you bring it up in the way of saying this is because we want the best for you. That's correct. You know, and we, it's also that you can start it with little conversations mm -hmm. years ahead of time. Like I like to tell my kids now what I expect and you better not do something down mm -hmm. the road that I don't want because this is what we would want. Okay. And so I think those conversations have to happen at earlier and I think many times people do talk about those things. Okay, and that, that's really good advice to anyone listening tonight. If you do have older parents or someone you're concerned about and haven't raised these issues, it would be good in a non-threatening, non-emergent situation to sit down and say, you were there for me, and now it's my turn to be here for you. So what do you want to do about yes. certain things? And just, Mom, what would you want if this happened? And I just want to make sure I'm doing what you want, not what I think I should do at the time. Right. Because that's hard to do for and what about the situation where your parent comes home from the physician and says, they're, they, they say, I'm fine. And your gut is saying, something's not right. I still know mom, and that's not right. And doc, you know, they said, no, it's just, you're just getting old. Don't worry about it. Are we just getting old? Don't worry about it? Or should we pursue every change? How do you know? I'm not sure that we should pursue every change. I think you have to gauge it by your parents and what your gut's telling you. Mm -hmm. If your gut's telling you, I think there's something wrong. I think you've got to try to talk to them first mm -hmm. because 
I do think if they're fully okay faculty-wise and they know what they want to do, we shouldn't impose too much. We should kind of gently guide and steer. Okay. It's hard to, you know, do that. It but is. that is the best way to do it and mm -hmm. talk about it early. Okay. I, can't I think that's the key here, you, talking about it early. Um, one of my questions was, what should a caregiver look for when assessing nursing care for a parent? So if you're at the point of, you know, your, your mom or dad needs additional help, whether it's long-term care, whether it's assisted living, whether it's a home care agency just coming in to check, medical or non-medical, again, that should be part of the conversation. And you yourself as the caregiver could ask to be on those records so that you could talk to the caregivers? That's correct. That's and correct. You can ask to be on the records, have your mom or dad give you permission mm -hmm. to get some things. Because I'm going to tell you, when you have someone critically ill, you can hear what the physician's saying but you're not comprehending. Right. And I can tell you that mm -hmm. having this in my own family, and my, uh, I hope my daughter-in-law doesn't get mad, but she's a nurse too, <laughs> and her dad was critically ill, and they wanted my son to go because they thought they knew right away, even though she was a nurse, I'm not going to remember a thing. I need him to go and really understand what's going on. It's not bad to take notes. It's right. not bad to write questions down. And it's not bad to go in with some type of, you know, thoughts in your mind about what you def definitely need answers mm -hmm. to. And it, because it's hard when you're in there, you walk you out the off. door you and how many off. people say, oh my God, I forgot to ask that question. Right. And that was one of the most important questions. And again, so, I mean, the geriatrician, the philosophy of physicians who only treat older people or hospitals and only care for older people, uh, take that into account. That's know correct. that the older adult is maybe shutting off a little bit because of the news they've just gotten. They and do. can respond a little bit to it in a more appropriate Especially way. Especially if it's traumatizing news or something mm -hmm. that totally you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very. What scares you about my opening statistics as a professional? Um, I th think the fact that we're going to have such an increase mm -hmm. of the population of um, older adults over 85, they're saying, and it's like that's a 32% increase, I think, in Connecticut with the census, because Connecticut is the old, seventh oldest na uh, state in the nation, demographically. And I think it's hard for people because I I do think demographics and what people want are changing so drastically mm -hmm. that now people do not want to be always in nursing homes, they want to be home, mm -hmm. they want to be in facilities that they can still have a great quality of life mm -hmm. and move forward in. And there's some interesting, um, interesting explorations, I guess I'll call them, even in this country and other um, countries now, they're actually built something in one of the Scandinavian countries where it's a whole village in all older adults are in it with many times dementia and having memory issues and they have them living with just regular caregivers regular clothes doesn't even look like any type so it's like of a homes. blue community they're trying to put it's a an, type of patient together so to speak or that's correct put, Interesting. And I think the pieces that baby boom, boomers and younger want different mm. ways to be cared for. Exactly. And I think we're not equipped mm. to do that just yet. And the <sighs> other piece I worry about um, is there is predicted, because I'm a nurse, <laughs> there's predicted to be a very large shortage of nurses because mm. Many bedside nurses, too, they're going into many different fields, mm. and now there aren't the 
quantity to really provide care and they're Just saying really in the them. next 20 years oh there's going to be a significant shortage just like there's a shortage of geriatricians <sighs> and primary care physicians there will be a shortage of nurses i can't believe we're almost coming to the end already and every show i'm going to ask each guest to give me or to give us their top three health and wellness tips for seniors, and I like to phrase it, if you were gonna give your parents, what were the top three tips you're giving them, Kathy? I might have four, okay, but go I'll ahead. go fast. <laughs> I think the best thing is to stay active. You know, all the studies stay, say if you can walk 30 minutes five times mm. a week, even if you're not walking to the you know speed that you think you should be, Keep yourself active. Park your car okay. a little further away from the grocery store. <laughs> Walk when you can to your neighbor's house. Just fit it in. Doesn't okay. matter three, ten minutes or whatever. Second thing, flu season. Wash your hands <laughs> multiple times mm -hmm. a day. Um, keep washing them. Germs are passed on your hands the most. And so just remember to wash. And then eat a healthy diet, lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and then see your physician regularly. Mm. And a geriatrician, if you're an older adult, is excellent to get into. So those are my four quick tips. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our first show tonight and you found the discussion not only informative, but entertaining and you had some fun. What we'd like to say is if you have questions for Kathy or anything we discussed tonight, please email your questions to join the discussion at HebrewHealthcare.org. If you also have suggestions for upcoming topics, you may also do that as well. Again, join the discussion at HebrewHealthcare.org. Until next month, thank you for joining us. Stay healthy and be happy.